I think this comes down to the fundamental worldview of uh, every person who encounters a technology that empowers individuals. And if you look at the trajectory of technology, we see this happening again and again. People were terrified with the idea that um, a single individual could own a printing press and print their own Bible. Uh, people were terrified with the idea that a blogger could write an article and compete head-to-head -head with the New York Times. People were terrified with the idea of um, people being able to own weapons, for example. And, you know, each of these has represented a challenge for society, which is what, does it, what happens when an individual becomes powerful? And how do we handle that in a society where some people are not up to good? That doesn't mean that we can actually control these technologies. Unfortunately, controlling technologies means that we make it uh, difficult for individuals who obey the law to use the technology, but individuals who disobey the law will simply disobey this law as well, and they will use whatever technology they can. So this is a fundamental societal challenge, which is how do you trust people with the power of a bank? Uh, I would argue that compared to some of the other challenges we have, you know, the fact that someone can 3D print a gun or um, build something with CRISPR uh, that does genetic um, manipulation of DNA, uh, I think those are bigger challenges or what you can do with a 3D printer or the fact that you can drive a three-ton truck. Uh, anywhere you want. Those are all bigger challenges for society than the idea of people using money and being able to express themselves uh, and associate with others and have commercial interactions. My worldview is really simple. The vast majority of people will use this new capability to lift themselves from poverty. Their primary objectives will be to achieve food, security, healthcare, sanitation, education for them and their children. Um, and that is a good thing because uh, billions of people are outside of that today. So in uplifting billions of people, I am personally willing to take the risk that some people will use that for evil because the net good that is done um, is enormous. That's a utilitarian philosophy of, of good versus evil. Some people see it very, very differently. That's the philosophical and moral perspective. Then there's the practical perspective. And the practical perspective is really simple. This technology now exists. Anyone can recreate it. There is no going back. We have to, as a society, face the consequences of these technologies, all of these technologies, and the fact that individuals will have these powers. So how do we make sure that most use it for good, and those who don't are appro appropriately handled by society. And, and that has nothing to do with the technology, really. We can't constrain technology as a means for social policy. Whenever it's been tried in the past, what it does is it results in disenfranchising people who have good intentions, and um, criminals still go on and use whatever they can use. Uh, so uh, I'm more interested in the possibilities that open if we can give equal access to a world economy to billions of people who don't have it today. I prefer the term token uh, because token really represents this concept of an abstraction that may or may not carry value but which can be held, traded, owned, uh, by someone. Uh, a token can be, uh, you can think of it simply as a casino chip. Uh, you can think of a token as the key to your house. Uh, you can think of a token as a playing card. You can think of a token as um, an ID card. Uh, so it has all of these different characteristics. Tokens can be used to contain value, as with a casino chip. They can be used as a means of access, as a car key or house key is. Um, they can be used to identify membership of an organization, like, for example, your business card or your employment door access card. Um, they can represent uh, um, loyalty towards a team, a brand, an artist. Uh, they can represent many different things. These abstractions sometimes have monetary value, sometimes don't. Sometimes their monetary value is hard to discern. 
uh, because they're not actively traded. Uh, other times they really are pure money. Other times they are more used for access to products or services. And this new world of tokens will touch every aspect of our lives. You know, every single brand that currently has a loyalty card that gives you air miles or points or something like that, that is a token. It's not currently a token based on an open protocol that's freely tradable in open markets, but it will have to be. And the reason it will have to be is because the second version is much better. A token that is tradable is much more powerful than one that isn't. So everything today that we see that represents loyalty, access, uh, value, uh, association, etc., can be represented by an unforgeable digital token that is fully transferable and tradable, that operates on a global basis, that is completely unforgeable. And the fact that any five-year-old can create such tokens and imbue them with the qualities of global access, unforgeability, perfect security, tradability on liquid markets everywhere in just a few minutes means that we will have millions of them. Kindergarten children will generate tokens to represent their friends. Why not? They can. They do it today when they trade blocks and rubber bands. They'll do it with digital tokens in the future that will represent their digital pets, their friends, their associations. And if you imagine that rippling across society, the tokenization of many different things, fundamentally what these tokens represent is abstractions of language. They are used to express value. And in any field of life in which humans feel the need in order to grow stronger bonds, in order to affiliate themselves with others, to express loyalty or friendship, to exchange value, to trade commerce, to participate in organizations. All of those activities are expressive activities. And now we have these universal tokens that can act as the abstractions that allow us to express these activities. And humans talk a lot. And we will talk with tokens because that's how we will express these things. So one thing that has become evident with the emergence of Bitcoin and the internet and other related network-based global technologies is that we flipped the world around, whereby in the past the power and authority of a central institution such as a king, a sovereign, uh, flows downwards and gives rights to the people. You know, part of the world as we've known it since the Enlightenment, since the Renaissance, uh, since the Industrial Revolution and now since the emergence of the Internet is one in which we understand that individuals on their own have rights, have expression, have power. And now that power is flowing upwards. It's grassroots, it's emergent, and it comes out of loosely associated human populations who may be geographically spread all around the world, who share a common voice, who share a common interest or a common idea, whether that's uh, religion or whether it's belief in an idea, whether it's a belief in a political idea, or whether it's the fact that they all love Justin Bieber. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. But in the case of currency specifically, money has particular power within a society. Because if you can create money in a top-down way, using the authority of a sovereign, and then uh, imposing that currency on an entire population as a monopoly, that conveys great power. Just like when the sovereign could define the religion of the state and impose that on all of the citizens before we had secular government and separation of church and state, that power was awesome, immense, and uh, terrifying, and dangerous, and corrupting. The power over money is similarly awesome, terrifying, immense, and corrupting. And it corrupts democracies, and it corrupts sovereigns, and it corrupts governments, and it corrupts large multinational corporations. What if we flip that around? What if money doesn't come from above, granted to the people, but emerges from below and used by the people? 
then individuals themselves can give this currency power. And that power is their own power, because they choose to participate in this currency. And by choosing to participate, they give it velocity, which is the exchange of currency and commerce. And that velocity gives it value, and that value makes it powerful, which makes more people participate. You have this emergent uh, power that comes from the masses. It is the ultimate democratic phenomenon. It is a bottom-up emergence of value as a common language without rulers. Um, and I think that's where you, you see the idea that sovereignty emerges from currency rather than the other way around. Well, the, the problem is that um, for the vast majority of human history, uh, money had two natures. It had a, an abstract nature as a symbol. It's a symbol in terms of just like language or letters are symbols or mathematical notations are symbols um, that um, represent something else. In the case of money, it represents the value you want to exchange with the person you're trading with. It represents the value of the product you hope to receive in return. Value isn't inherent to money. It's simply expressed by money. It symbolizes. But at the same time, most of the forms of money we've had have been very, very tangible. Not abstract at all. A physical thing you hold, a shiny coin, a crisp piece of paper, a certificate from a bank, a gold deposit, a share certificate, a letter from the king, a line of credit. These very physical manifestations of money fool us into believing that money is physical even though it's not, it's just an abstraction. And the more we see the physical and the abstract tied together, uh, the harder it is to discern the real nature of money. Well, Bitcoin now brings that to a head, because there is no physical at all. There is no tangible representation of Bitcoin. Except for the shiny gold coins with a B inscribed on them, uh, that are made as souvenirs and trinkets for those new to Bitcoin. And if you look at every single newspaper article, magazine article, TV program about Bitcoin, at some point in the show, those gold B-inscribed trinkets will show up. Because people are so tied to a physical manifestation that even when one doesn't exist, they'll bring out a trinket to represent it. Uh, and it's hilarious because in the Bitcoin space they call that the journalist startup kit, which is a series of photos of these trinkets that absolutely have nothing to do with Bitcoin itself. We need the physical because it's something we understand. And if you talk to people who are confused and skeptical about Bitcoin, they often say things like, it's not money if I can't touch it. Which is ironic because the money that we have in the world less than 8% of it takes physical form. So of the entire amount of money that circulates, that is in checking accounts, and saving accounts, and corporate accounts, in certificates, in bonds, in all of the other forms of broad money circulation, less than 8% of global money exists as physical coins or notes. So what we're actually touching isn't the money. 92% of it doesn't exist in that physical form. Yet people feel so tied to it that they'll say things like, it's not money if I can't touch it. Actually, it is, and it has been for quite a while. You just haven't noticed. Um, you know, this is really the fundamental aspect of money that is so mysterious to us. The other is this observation, and I don't remember who has talked about this specifically, but I believe it was a sci-fi author. Um, and it, it may have been Arthur C. Clarke, so I'll just quote it as if it was, and we'll see how it goes. Um, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, and the idea being that once a technology is advanced enough, it, it looks like magic to those who don't understand it. The corollary of that, which is rather interesting, is the idea that once a technology is established enough, it stops being a technology and becomes completely invisible. We don't think of technology around us that ex has existed in our culture for thousands of years as technology anymore. It's just so embedded 
that we don't even see that it exists. Money is one of those. Money as a technology has existed for thousands of years, and it's become so enmeshed in our culture, in our language, in our traditions, in our way of thinking, that we no longer see it. It's completely transparent, just like language. We don't really think of language as a communications technology. It's just part of human nature. And so, when you have something that is simultaneously abstract, but most people view it as physical, that's part of culture that has been embedded for thousands of years that we don't teach in schools, because why would you examine something so basic? People often have very strange ideas about what it is and how it works. When I talk to people about Bitcoin, every single one of their first 10 or 15 questions, if they're absolutely new to this, reveal not that they don't understand Bitcoin, but reveal that they don't understand money. One of the most common ones is actually almost comical. I'll talk to people about Bitcoin and they'll say, but how can it have value? It's not backed by anything. And I'll say, okay, well, what is the Swedish krona or what is the US dollar backed by? And they'll say, oh, it's backed by the gold that's in the vaults at Fort Knox. That is equivalent in monetary terms as the story of Santa Claus. It's a fantasy we tell children. It doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed for 90 years now, since the 1930s. We no longer have gold reserves in Fort Knox that actually back our money. Our money used to say one dollar silver dollar certificate, meaning that you could take the paper note to the bank, you could give it to the banker, and they were obliged by law to give you a pure silver dollar uh, in return for that certificate. Every single dollar in circulation had that amount of silver equivalent backing it. But that hasn't existed for 90 years. And yet most people don't even know that that doesn't exist. They have this fantasy, this mythology around money, this simplified story for children about how money works and how it's issued. In fact, if you told people the real story of money, they'd look at you like you were a two-headed alien and tune out of the conversation almost immediately. I did this at one of the conferences where I replicated the conversation between a mother and her daughter. And the young girl goes, Mommy, what is money? And for the first time, what happens if the mother actually answers that question? Okay, Jenny, well, you see, money is a is a system of bilateral obligations traded through the international bank that uses special drawing rights, which is a virtual meta-currency that is a basket currency of all nations, calibrated for GDP. These are traded on international markets where each government has a treasury that issues debt. That debt is issued to private corporations that issue notes in return for that debt to buy treasury bonds that are floated on an open market with yield and price. These are then distributed to regional banks, which use a system of fractional reserve to extend credit to small businesses and individuals, thereby creating velocity in the economy. But that velocity must be carefully calibrated to adjust for inflation, so as not to create a loss in value of the average currency unit. Now, if mommy said that, because <laughs> that is the correct answer, Jenny would be very confused. So instead, mommy says something like, oh, it's like gold. It's valuable, and we use it to trade. We don't know money because money has become such a complex technology with giant infrastructures and interests and international relations, that it has become this invisible machinery of the state that we do not question. In fact, the ability to not question money is one of the greatest privileges. If you have the ability to not question money, that means your government and its money functions. And the moment it stops functioning, everything goes to hell, and you immediately have to learn very quickly what inflation is, and then what hyperinflation is, and why money is important, and what happens when it goes wrong. And out of 194 countries, a good hundred of them repeat that lesson every 20 to 30 years, destroying the wealth of a generation, because they don't understand what money is. And so, what is money? 
If we could answer that question simply, then bringing people a new form of money and saying simply, okay, this is the same thing, only a digital representation that is community and collaborative based, they'd understand it. But because people don't understand money, they can't understand this new form of it. They simply have to decide whether they trust or not that it still works more or less in the same way. And of course, most people don't. It takes a while to overcome these hurdles and preconceived notions about what money is, and to trust that a new form can work. But we've done this before. The first time someone pulled out a diner's club credit card and went to a hotel and said, I don't have money, I have diner's club, the hotel person's response was, sorry, I don't know what that is, but that's not money. You know, credit cards were introduced in 1950. At first, nobody believed that you could actually do this with just a piece of paper, not plastic at the time, and say, here's this card, trust me, it's as good as money. The first time someone gave a paper note from the Bank of England, instead of a gold coin to a merchant, that merchant laughed in their face and said, sorry mate, we only take real money here, none of that paper. And this goes back through history, right? It took almost 400 years for paper currency to be accepted as a viable form of money. It took almost 60 years for, car uh, for credit cards to be accepted broadly as a form of money. We can do it in less than 20 for Bitcoin.